All right, testing one, two, three. All right, excellent. All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, Allison, thank you for also joining me here today. Uh, being a Star Wars fan, I have to ask you, are you also a Star Wars fan? Absolutely, awesome. 100%. Okay, so what movie is your favorite movie? Rogue One. Excellent yes. choice, right? Rogue yes, Rogue One. Yeah, excellent. Sorry, sorry, get excited. Okay, uh, so a little bit of a spoiler alert if you haven't seen this movie and The New Hope. Uh, so at the end of Rogue One, right, Darth Vader is chasing Princess Leia's ship over Scarif. Yes. Right, at the end of Rogue One. At the beginning of The New Hope, they are at Tatooine. So, routing question. Did Princess Leia's ship, were they trying to make the fastest route from Scarif to Alderaan? Or were they going some weird roundabout route and happened to end up over Tatooine, right? Because Tatooine's supposed to be out, out in the middle of nowhere. Scarif, you would assume it being an important complex, would be not so far away. So I don't know. So I'm, yes, how would I answer a question like that? Allison. Well, you know, it's a good thing you asked, Jason, because that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Let's find out how we do this. Cool. There are a couple of seats up front if you guys want to come on in. We've got a couple up here and then sort of middle seats up through here as well. Sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. So we got to start with data, right? So there are fortunately like some websites where other people have digi diligently created maps of the Star Wars universe, right? So we can scrape some of this data. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many systems are we talking about? Um, I think we've got a little over 2,000 planets and systems in our data set. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of systems to figure out routing for. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, and what, the, what are these lines here? Oh, those are hyperdrive lanes. So the hyperdrive lanes are where you can actually go at very fast hyperdrive speed, and you're not going to run into anything. So it's kind of like the interstate of the Star Wars galaxy. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. All right, so we got systems, they're coordinate data, we got freeways in space. And what about planets that are not on the freeway? How do... How do how do people get from system to system? I mean, if it were me, I, I actually live in a small town myself. So for me, you go to exit 16, make a right, and two towns over, and then you get to me. So I think you'd probably do something similar to that. Okay. Probably hit the hyperdrive lane, get as close as I could, pop out, hit the planet. Okay. All right. So we got all this data. Yeah. Uh, so what do we do from there? Like, uh, so I'm not, I'm not a routing expert. I, like this, to me as a developer, seems like a really daunting problem to figure out. So probably the first thing I would do since we have a room full of amazing developers, is I, I would, oh, yeah, yeah, please. I would press this button, and I would set up a Rebel Developer Alliance registration form and ask the audience to help me with this problem. Uh, so if you have a phone or um, you got your laptop open, if you could just go to the site real quick and just register yourself and here you can put whatever you want for the call sign. Sorry. If, what, do we, what, what special things do we have for this? So we do have prizes available. So what we're doing right now is we're picking developers that are going to be helping us build this navigation system. And so we've got a number of different prizes that are available to be revealed later. Yes. So what we're going to ask you to do is just log in. And do you want to walk through what's in there? Yes. OK. Yeah. So let me walk over here. Okay, so put in any call sign you want. Uh, the unique identifier will be your email. So you can put any email you want, but if you want to be part of the, the prize list, definitely put in some email that you actually own. Programming languages. So put in any of the programming languages that you know to any significant, significant degree. I'm assuming Python will definitely be <laughs> predominant on this list, but definitely just put your other languages. File a guess. Just, just a guess. <laughs> uh, the people you associate with. So which famous Star Wars characters would you consider your closest friends? Like, who would you associate more with? Darth Maul, Obi-Wan? So go and put in a small list of folks. And then the last thing is, choose your home world. I mean, we know your actual home world, but I know your actual, actual home world. Uh, so there's a list here of famous Star Wars planets. Just choose any which one that you think reflects you as a, as a person, as a Star Wars <laughs> character. Which one do you like most? And then once you're done, just click register, and uh, we'll populate database in the back end and uh, because there, there is no ways for intergalactic travel so we're going to need to hire some people to help us build this yes so that's basically what we're going to build right is yeah. ways for intergalactic travel okay all right we talked about prizes and okay 
Oh, yes. Uh, so after everybody's registered, we've got, uh, we'll have some data, right? So, you know, if I were to build this straight up, I'd probably use a uh, Postgres database because that's one of the few databases I know anything about. Uh, so I'd start with like a table of all of us, right? All our developers uh, who were associated with skills and I'd build tables for each like component, right? A list of programming languages, a table for characters, a table for all the planets, all right? So I've got all this data in a Postgres database. Because everybody loves a table. Because everyone loves when tables. When in doubt, go with the table. Go with the table. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so as a developer, where, do, where, do I, where should I go from here, Alice? So here's, a, here's the, the challenge that I'm seeing right now, Jason, is obviously everybody goes with the table. It makes sense. Everybody grew up on relational databases. But where I'm struggling is I'm struggling in this top table where we see the name of the developer, and then they've got a bunch of different languages, perhaps and then they have a number of different associates. And so the challenge that I'm having in this is how are we gonna handle this many to many, right? We're trying to figure out who are the developers that we need, but some people know some languages, some people know other languages. How are we gonna handle that? You know, right now, it's a pretty short list. We could see which one is the right one, but when we've got thousands and thousands of developers, how are we going to actually have the right people sort of come to the top hmm. so that we know who to hire? It seems like it could be a bit of a challenge. Yes. What do you think? Well, if, uh, if I were building this, which I guess I am, um, I'd start with kind of a high-level workflow, like how am I going to solve this, right? So I'd start with maybe the skills. Like, do the developers that I'm interested in have the skills that kind of match up with the rest of the team? And then I would kind of figure out, like, are they trustable, right? Like, based on their associates, are they, you know, are they kind of leaning more toward Rebel, or are they really kind of more Imperial, sympathetic? And then where do they live? Do they live close to where we're going to have our crack team of rebel developers hiding, right? Because if, if they're all the way across the galaxy, it might be expensive and dangerous to try to bring them in. So these are probably the three main things I would look for with the registration form data that we have. Okay. And then probably have some sort of ranking rubric at the very end. Yeah? Okay. Does that sound like a reasonable, something doable? I mean, I don't know. It seems like a reasonable approach. Anyone? No? No? Okay. So... If we've got everything in a table, you'll probably run some kind of SQL query to give you this. So what, mm. what might that look like? Uh, okay, so I would probably look up what the best SQL uh, uh, statement would be. But you know, here's an example of something that would work that would look through all our tables and give us a subset of developers that at least made our initial kind of Rubik choice, right? Okay. Like if we know what systems we were kind of working around, what their skills are, I think, I think this would more or less work, yes? Okay. I mean, it's, it's a good start, but we kind of have the same problem we had before, which is how are we, how are we actually ranking them? And what happens if you want to change it up? What if instead of it being this language, you want another language? Like, is it very flexible? Like, what do you think? Well, you know, there's some things that we could tweak, right? We make certain things, uh, parameters. And I mean, once we get this subset of developers, right, then mm -hmm. I can run them through a rules engine inside my app. Yeah. Right? So I could kind of split, split the load. I've got to be honest, I'm still not thrilled about this many-to-many -many problem. I don't really like the way this is coming out. It's coming out, one row is a developer, kind of aggregating in a way that I think we're losing a lot of context. So i got to tell you, I don't love it. Okay, what, uh, what do you think would be better? Well, I'm really uh, am concerned about this many-to-many. -many. So let me tell you what my problem is. So my problem I have here is we've got the, we've got the individuals, and we've got these different languages that they may know. Mm -hmm. But what I'm seeing is I'm definitely seeing some repeats within these lists, right? Everybody loves a dictionary, right? But how, like, these are just at the, the letter. So right now I'm looking at like a one to many, right? I've got the one developer with many languages. And then I'm seeing that there's relationships on the other side, like a couple people know Python. Does it matter how many people know? Or is there a relationship between those who know? So I think this is giving us one to many. But we don't really get the relationship between the developer and the language in this case, right? So this doesn't really work for me. So then if I want to make sure that I know exactly what the relationship is between the developer and their language, like, okay, we'll go with the list of tuples, say. So now I can see, yes, this person definitely knows this language, but I'm missing the aggregate. So in either of these many-to-many -many instances, I'm either getting an aggregate on one side or I'm losing context, right? So I'm not really finding a way to get us to where 
we really need to be. Okay. So how do we how do we get to where we need to be? I'm really glad you asked that because that's another one of the reasons we're here today. What we need is we need a new data structure. And the data structure that we're talking about now is using a graph. So in the graph, what we're looking at here is we're looking at the two circles or what we call nodes. And the connection between the two of them is the edge or the relationship. Here we've got the entity of the person, which is the developer, and on the right-hand side we have the language. And so in the graph database, what we do is we capture these entities and we capture the relationships. So I think this looks pretty good, don't you? Okay, I, I can follow this. Yeah. Uh, Still a one-to-one -one now, huh? Yeah, like yeah, I, I don't yeah. see how that's any better than Yeah, than that's what, not really helping us. Earlier. All right, so let's get a little more detail. We actually put the person on, we put on the language, but Gray Leader knows more than one language. So now what we have is we have the, we can actually see the breakdown of the language as well as the developer itself. And so now we can definitely see that we've made some improvements. So how does this feel? I'm still not sold, still not sold. Yeah, you think it's because it's a one to many and we're still yeah, are not many to many? Like, you know, I can still get the list from, yeah. you know. Table. Well, once the graph starts to expand, this is where this is where the gold comes in for us. Because now what we can see is we can see we've got two different developers. We can see their relationships to each of the languages. And now we can even start to understand the impact of the language itself. In this particular instance, both of them know Python. So that starts to come to the fore as possibly being more important and more common. And again, it's a small set. But what it does is it allows us to really capture the many to many, and it allows us to see the forest and the trees at the same time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, visually, this, look, this looks great, but, you know, what about, you know, this is just the skills. What about our, our other criteria? I'm glad you brought that up because the great thing about the graph database is that we can bring in all different types of relationships. So for example, we were previously looking at the developer and the language. One of the criteria that was mentioned was who are this person's associates? What do we know about those associates? Which planet are they currently living on? And so what we, I, what we do now is we take those many to many and we continue to expand in this basic data form. So now we can see one person may have similar associates. So similar to what we were having here, you can imagine how it then expands once we add more types of relationships. Um, in this case, we see like a self-referencing edge on associate because there could be multiple associates that are connected with each other. So sometimes you can, you can have that as well. So that's another thing that you might see. Okay. So, and but in the real world, is it ever as simple as it is in the toy example when you're learning Python? No, of course not. So in the real world, once we actually get all of our data loading in, it starts to look like this, where we've got all different kinds of systems, and we've got characters, and we have developers, and we've got topics. And it gets very, very complex. So this is what the data starts to look like once we populate it past just a couple of gray leaders. So what do you think? That looks uh, very complicated and a lot like our original sort of problem. Yeah, yeah, because many to many is complex, right? Mm. Well, you know what the best part is? What we really appreciate about the graph is the following, that we have an ability to capture the complexity, we have an ability to capture the forest and the trees, but in order to extract the information, the language that we use, Cypher query, is actually very, very simple. So what you're gonna see here on the right, this is a, this is a call, and we see the word developer is in parens. Well, they're kind of curved, which looks a little bit like a node, so it makes it pretty easy, right? Then we have brackets around the relationship, which is nose. And then we have another node, language, and we have the parens. And so what I really like about Cypher is it's very similar to Python. It's very easy when you read it to understand what am I asking. I'm asking, show me developers who know languages and it's going to give you the return of all those nodes of where developers know languages. Okay. How's that? Okay, this, you know, this makes Pretty sense good, to me. Right? Yeah. Like, I'm extrapolating from this, if I want information on associates, I'm just replacing, you know, nodes with friend of, associate, developer from a, a system or a planet. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right, I'm, I'm following that. But uh, I do have a question about 
Like, oh, okay. So here's an example of pulling from a planet. Okay, so uh, naturally my next sort of question is, like, like this is great, right? Visually I understand this. I got a query language that will return to me quite a bit of information. But do, do I need to work with the information as a graph? Like, I really don't want a graph. I just want, like, a list of No. Stuff. And that's the other thing is, you know, as we showed you before, the graph, the visualization of the graph itself is very hard for the human to interpret because it is so large. And so what we have within the graph network is we have the ability to actually return, say, a list. So in this particular query, we do match. So match basically says collect these pieces. So collect all the developers who are friends of and associate. Then, similar to in a SQL query, we're just going to refine it a little bit. And we want to do some math. So in this case, we haven't shown it here. But for each of these nodes, you can have properties that live within them. So in our case, in what we've built, we have an associate. And each associate has um, a rebel affinity calculation. And so what we want is we say, OK, give me all the developers who have friends who are associates, but I want to know what is the average rebel affinity of all of their friends. You want to know me, know my friends. So we're looking at their network to give us an understanding of how likely are they to actually be sympathetic to the rebel cause. But what it returns is it just returns a list of developers. And it says, okay, these are all the developers where the average rebel affinity of everyone in their network is over 0.5. So you're going to get a list back from this one, Jason. Okay, great. Okay, so I went and looked at the APIs, and so when I do a call like this, I get basically JSON objects for each of these developers. Great, I can work with JSON objects. Okay, so from basically this, I've gone ahead and kind of built out a dashboard that shows data from all the developers that have kind of signed on here. All right, so put this QR code if you wanted to jump to this dashboard and play around with it directly. Otherwise, what I'll do here is bring it up. And I'm going to filter out all my test data, hopefully. Oh, you know what? Let me do this from yesterday. OK. All right, so let me start with this. So first, when I did this, I was creating sort of this manual search rubric, right? So if I've got my rebel planet, which uh, I have a randomizer or a secret uh, code system that tells me where the base <laughs> is. And so the base right now is in the car. <laughs> I can't pronounce that one. Okay, Dcar, and so I put some of the, the basic data from those cipher calls that, that you kind of showed. So I have a count of everyone who knows you know, our, our top languages, right? So Python, 69 developers know Python, et cetera. Put this into a table. Um, and now I've got this sort of dynamic search system so I can figure out, okay, so if our base is here in, let's change this to Dcar. And uh, if I want to limit our jumps to, I don't know, 32 hyperspace jumps away, and maybe at least somebody who's kind of neutral, find me all the developers uh, that match this. And I think Dakar might be too far away. And unfortunately, yes. So, <laughs> so here, you know, and I was playing around with this, and so it takes me a while to figure out, you know, where, what sort of distance people should be and whatnot to really find a good cluster of developers. Well, fortunately, I, I did, a, did a little more digging, and basically just change my queries to basically take these languages, assuming that we want a team that uses you know, the top three languages, and somewhere near, you know, or, oh, our base is moved to Yavin. So I created this auto-ranking system that just basically points, you know, according to this Rubik, gives people points for how close they are, what lang how many languages they have that meets our needs, et cetera. And now I've got this self-ranking system to tell me which of our developers um, we should task with our, our team. Codasaurus is leading the pack. Yes, by far with 45 points. Yeah, this guy's killing it. Yeah. Awesome, coolness. Okay, so, great. So now we have our developers. Right. So now we know, like, how many, how, I'm not sure how many you put in your team. Put three in, three in your three, team, three, right? Yeah. yeah, I think we got three in your team. So you've got your team. You're ready to actually build ready. the ways for galactic space. All right. All right, All right. show me what you got. Okay, so I'm kind of still at the, the same point that I started, right? So I've got, I've got this data, and even if I'm kind of like scanning through SDW Galaxy Map, okay, this data's good, the data I have is good. 
I've got three crack developers with me. I'm still not entirely sure where I should start. Well, let's start with the information that you have, right? Okay. You put together a nice little table, right? Mm. So let's take a look at, well, wait, where are we? Yeah. Back over here? Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. So let's go take a look at the data that we have. So one of the things that we see here in the data on this right-hand side is whether or not this any of these particular planets are on a hyperdrive lane. Because obviously, if you can take the interstate, you could. Right. right? So the question becomes, if we've got it in this table, if, when you're actually in Python, how are you going to use it? What, what do you think? Uh, well, I'd, I guess I'd start with the brute force approach. I would come up with lots of functions to basically stitch together that path from one system to another. Yeah, so that's what you've got here, right? Your hyperdrive lanes, you've got a key, which is the run, and then you've got an ordered list of each of the planets in the run. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that seems All yeah, right. That's a good start. Okay, that's one way of going about it. Um, and Jason, when if you're using that sort of a structure, what does the actual code look like to use that structure oh, to it, build a path? It looks something like this. You know, I'd probably have a few functions and spread it out, but you know, basically I'd you know, I'd right. stitch it together with functions. And and how much is actually covered by the code that you have here? Uh, a small chunk of it. Yeah, very, very small. So when you imagine what the nested if-then statements are going to be that you're going to have to put together to use a static dictionary to get from any place in the galaxy to any other place in the galaxy, it's not going to be easy because you have to think of all the use cases, right? Mm. And you've got to think about your edge cases and you've got to make sure that all those things are there, right? Right. How are you feeling about having about this being the task for you and your team? Well, this is why I have three crack developers to help with all this. Right? We're so glad you guys are here. Codasaurus, we appreciate you. So here's the thing. Let's go back to the beginning and let's think about this. So let's go back to the actual problem. Hmm. So whenever you get into this, I mean, it's all, it's happened to everybody, right? You get into some like weird mind numbingly nested scenario where you're like, please God save me. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea to just go back and actually reevaluate re the problem and say, let me look at this again and find out if there's a better way to do it. So what do you think? What have you got, Jason? Hmm. Well, you know, this, this you know, visualizes the plot and all the functions I'd have to do, right? Because I'm starting with some start point, some end point, and I'm just going to work the table and find what system's connected to which one and sort of tally up each course and pick the course that's smallest. Yeah. You know, Jason, I have a question for you. There, mm. There's something that feels very familiar about this graphic we're looking at right now. Does it look like anything we've seen before today? It looks a lot like a graph. It sure does, doesn't it? Amazing. So the question then becomes, is there a way that we can use the graph we already have to solve Jason and the developers team path problem? Well, again, we talked about this before, that we can expand the database that we have. So in this case, what we can do is we can, we are using the systems that were already there, but we're creating new relationships. So in this case, on the left-hand side, connected to means that these two planets are connected one next to the other on a hyperdrive lane. And then we also have, for any planet that's not on a hyperdrive lane, we've created something called a near relationship. And what it is, is it says, which hyperdrive planet is closest to the system. And so here, now we have all of the planets are connected together. We have them in this very simple format. And we have a way that we can now look at those paths within the graph setting. What do you think of that? That, that looks very promising. All right. Like and the best part about this is now you can actually, instead of having to run miles and thousands of lines of if-else statements for code, I'll, I'll let you, you, you gotta click for the next one. Okay, so went through the APIs again, and lo and behold, there is a shortest path function that will take in any sort of pattern, right? And I can just stick the pattern in there, and it will return to me a list of nodes that plots the course. That's the actual path. And again, what I love about this is just how straightforward it is. Because I probably, uh, has anybody here ever worked with Cypher before? 
All right, we have one, so nobody else has. But even just reading this, you can see, okay, I'm gonna match this start system. I'm gonna match it to this end system. And then I want the path to be the shortest from the start to the end. And this little bit in the middle says it can either be connected to or near. And then return the path. So the other thing that's great about Cypher is that the learning curve on the syntax is actually really straightforward. And so not only do you get the power of the data structure, but you have all your natural computer science logic that you're gonna run on the code itself. And so this right here, and it makes it super simple. Instead of all your crazy if-thens, because there may be a circumstance where you want to alter this somehow, right? Can you think of an, an, an instance where we might not want to go to a particular planet? Uh, you know, to avoid maybe Darth Vader or yeah. wherever the Imperial fleet is. All right, so, okay. If we go back to the end of Rogue One, maybe if they had put in a different path, they wouldn't have ended up on Tatooine in the first right. place. They had Just a better, saying. A better navigation app. All right. So, okay, so I took that, that query that you gave us. Um, and then and the APIs that I found, and I uh, put up a quick Streamlit app for navigating the Star Wars galaxy, right? So again, another QR code if you wanted to play around with this, this app that's available now. Uh, but otherwise, I will show this to you. So here, so now we can see from Scarif to Alderaan. All right, oh, I guess let me talk about this. So uh, matplotlib, because, you know, mainstay of, of our environment. I don't know, it took quite a bit of work to make even just this, but um, <laughs> anyways, long story short, here, is, here are all the systems that we have data for. All the gray dots are systems that are off hyperspace lanes. Some of them actually are on hyperspace lanes, but in creating this data set, so we had coordinates and we, had, we knew which hyperspace lanes they were on, but we had no connective tissue. There was no table saying, this system is connected to another system. So I spent the last month looking at that galaxy map, seeing two lines, and then creating the other table. So anyways, blue planets, hyperspace lanes, gray, off lane, and white ones are kind of like the, uh, the important planets. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so now let's play around with this. So if I want to find this route between Scarif and Alderaan, does it include Tatooine? That is the question. That is the question. <laughs> that has been on my mind for two days. Okay, so here we've got a full course plot. Sadly, I have not figured out how to make matplotlib interactive in Streamlit, but we can see here I've got this course plot that came from the shortest path calculation. And looking here, I can see that Tatooine is not on this list. So the princess had gone, or the pilot of the ship had gone slightly a different route. I'm like, I'm kind of wondering, like what route did they take, right? So looking at, again, this map, we can see that Scarif is over here, Tatooine is here, and Alderaan is over here. So just looking at this map, you can probably tell like, oh, okay, they probably, the fastest route would be this direction, right? So for some reason, they did not go this direction, right? So, all right, let me, uh, let me exclude Manda here, all right? Let's assume that there's an imperial presence on Manda. Manda? Manda. And I gotta, I gotta avoid it, right? So the number of jumps only went up one, so one from 39 to 40. But I can see from this list that Tatooine is still not on this list. I'm like, where, how, how, are they getting, how are they getting to Tatooine? So I look at this map a little bit more and it's like, okay, so this route takes them this way, just skirts over Tatooine. So that must mean that one of these systems on this upper skirt is also, also has an imperial presence. So let's just put uh, Malarion in there. So I'll put Malarion. Plot this course, and here <laughs> I can see that Tatooine is on this course. All right, so this is one possible course that that ship was trying to do, was trying to evade or just having to want to not to go to those systems, and this is one possible plot course that they were going for. Okay, yeah, that looked good. I, I was happy I could do this with basically a single cipher call, and I'm just, displaying that data from that one call in, in different ways, right here for the map. So this, the same cipher call is powering both the map and that table, and also the number of jumps. So, mm -hmm. let's, okay, so that's, so we have, we basically have our hyperspace 
navigator. Yeah. Cool. It's a good thing Codasaurus was here. Yes. <laughs> So to Jason's point, what we're seeing now is that the cipher query that he had, all he's done is he's just added in this extra line here in green that allows him to put in planets to say avoid these planets. So when we avoid these planets, we're still getting back, back that path. And the way that the path is fed back, as Jason mentioned, is in a JSON. So whether you use that to plot it in matplotlib like he did up top or to return it in the the table format, even though something lives in graph, it doesn't have to be returned as a graph. You can leverage it any way you need. But what I love about this is it's just so much easier to edit than if we had actually hard-coded all those if-then statements, for yeah. sure. That's what I really like about playing with Cypher is I can basically add one or two lines in the query and get kind of a radically different data set that I can just, you know, I just pull in and use it differently. But I don't have to create, I'm just using one model for systems, one model for developers. And just by changing the query, I get different answers that quickly solve. So I'm really looking forward to, to actually adding more to this hyperspace lane app because this has been such an easy process to do. Suggestions or requests, you let us know. So one of the things that I really just wanna take a second to point out is that how do you know if you have a graph problem? When you're sitting at your desk and you're coding, how do you know that maybe there's another way that you can approach this? If you find um, you have many-to-many -many relationships, there's probably a way you can do it in graph more simply and elegantly. If you've got the nested if statements like we talked about, that's another opportunity for you to say, hey, is there a different way that I can do this? Whenever you're struggling with the data structures, what's the right data structure? Is this aggregating the right way? Any of those kinds of blockers that you have. Anybody had that problem before where you're like struggling with if-thens or you don't know what the right data structure is? Yeah, I see the nods. Yeah. Well, good news. You now have something new to try that can make your life much easier. Because ultimately, we want our code to be simple and elegant. We want it to be easy to maintain. We don't want to get lost in all of this nuance, right? I mean, I hate getting lost in my own code. I'm like, wait, which indent am I on right now? So what we really want you to take from this is this opportunity to say, if I'm in one of these ugly sort of messes, is there a way that graph can help me get through what we're looking at here? What about you? Any other like code smell that brings you to graph, Jason? Um, I don't know about codes. Well, so in, in the process of, of building these demo apps, um, again, like the flexibility of Cypher and the flexibility under, under the hood of just connecting new relationships to existing nodes gave me access to lots of new data, mm. right? So like, I love that I didn't have to spin up like multiple databases or spin up new tables, right? I had one graph database and I just changing labels for nodes and adding relationships to those nodes and that kind of multiplied the number of options I had every time I did this. Um, so that process was a lot of fun, right? Just, I mean, a graph is very it, visually like, I get it, right? Like connecting the dots, super easy. And then once I realized that you can pull single pieces of information and lists of data and dictionaries of data from that graph, like I don't have to work in the graph all the time, that, that was, yeah, that was a game changer. All right, I have one last question for you, Jason. How hard is it to get your data into a graph? Oh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't that hard at all. So there are a couple of options for importing data into Neo4j. Uh, the one that I found easiest was using data importer. Um, is how the pool is. Uh, so data importer basically is a, it's a kind of a WYSIWYG thing. So I can just drop in any CSV, and then I can create my data model, like uh, all those circles and lines, and I could just basically graphically put that up very quickly. And then I just notate which of the, the rows and the columns and whatnot go to which property, which node. Mm -hmm. And then I just click import, and it'll generate a bunch of Cypher and run the Cypher under the hood and do the import. Now, I could have done this myself. Uh, now that I know how to do Cypher, I can write that import code. But doing it in Data Importer was very, I thought, very flexible. Like, it was very quick to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what? Why don't I bring that up since I think we're, we're well ahead of time here? 
that's the one thing that I want everybody to get is that it's not a big lift, right? We're looking at a new data structure. We're looking at possibly some new tools, but it's not a big technical lift for something to pick up that can be really powerful. Um, you know, at Neo4j, we have free databases that you can pull up, that you can spin up on your own that are free and will be free. I think there's a size limit on them, but they cover a lot of use cases. So the, the onboarding into the graph universe, it's, it's, not a, it's not a heavy lift. So definitely look to this as an opportunity for those moments to really smooth things out for yourselves as well. So yeah, Jason's showing you the data importer now. Okay, so like in a production setting, I would definitely want to script out like a you know a better way to pro of pulling in data live, right? But when just experimenting, like this was super useful. So I threw in three CSV files, right? One for our, all our planets, the connections between them, and then the nearest planets for those that were off the hyperspace line. All right, so I've got this data in here. Now I can just start creating nodes, right? I can put it system is connected to another system. And here I'm just going to notate which file I'm going to pull this data from, and then what information from that file, right? So I want the name of the planet, uh, x, y coordinates would be great, because I'll need that later. Uh, region and sector, why not? A link in case, uh, oh, you know, make it more interactive later, that would be good. Okay, so I think that's really all I need from here. I'm going to have the names be unique, uh, rather than trying to dig up some other ID system. So here I can use the same table, uh, but what I really am interested in is the connected part, right? So here I want to say the system is connected to another system, All right? And I'm going to pull that from my connections file. Oops, uh, and I need to specify here. Here I, I could go either with planets, but uh, I'll just pull it right from the connections file again because all the names should match up. So here I have connected to. So which systems are connected to what? So I basically wanted to, if there is a system in the connections table that doesn't exist in the planets table, it will create that planet and then make the connection. So here, now that I have that data, I'm gonna do the name to the connected to file. And when I run import, it will connect all those systems. I've already done that, so I won't run it again, although it shouldn't hurt it at all. And if I do just a basic search, this will return way too many, but it'll give you a subset. And again, it shows it in this graph form, but it doesn't have to be. You can use it as a table. You could leverage it as a JSON in something that you were using, right? So there's a lot of flexibility as well. But again, we just want to show you like how accessible the, this opportunity is for you to make what you're coding much easier. Does anybody think of a use case of something that they've worked on recently that maybe you'd want to look at trying to look at it in a different way? I know, it's weird at first, right? It's a whole different way of thinking about something. But really, anytime you've got a many-to-many -many situation, you don't have to do complicated joins, you don't have to unwind it, you don't have to unpack it, it's just going to give you a way of doing something really simple and really clean. So Jason, I have a question for you. Um, our developers, hmm. did they finish building their system? They did, right? All right. So who who were the developers on our ah, on, on our, our crack team? team? Yeah. All right. Let's look here. Uh, let's because see. those developers on our team definitely are going to need to uh, be compensated. Yes, I believe they and should acknowledge. Be. They should. All right. So we've got uh, Codasaurus Tango Alpha. We've got an unnamed mysterious coder, which uh, I'll have to go through the database and dig up their email. Uh, but if you are that person whose friend is Yoda, your skills is C in Python, you from Alderaan, and if you remember, uh, oh yeah, how, how are people getting their prizes? Oh, so the, what we're gonna do is you put your emails in, we'll drop you an email and you can come pick them up at the booth. So when you go into the booth, we're sort of on the, the far right corner in the back. Um, we'll be there for the rest of, the, once the exhibition opens today and over the next couple of days, so definitely come on by. Do you wanna, do you wanna tell the audience what they've won, Jason? Oh, <laughs> yes, since I don't have it with me. So <laughs> we, got, uh, we got three, remo well, two remote control droids, one that uh, beeps and does other stuff, uh, and then we have a gift for the person who was uh, least hireable for the Rebel Dev team. Uh, so if you are Harem Rose, 
definitely come see us. We have a nice imperial um, uh, water bottle. Water bottle. Yes. To give you. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so much. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Yeah, come, there's a microphone oh. if you want to come up, or if you've got a big voice, feel free. Actually, I could. Uh, why don't I do this? I will hyperspace jump this over to you. <laughs> Maybe the whole stand will come. All right. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I saw you guys have a Python driver, but I didn't see like uh, an object to. In OGM? Yeah. We do. Relationship. The, the, so it will be cool if you can talk about that. Oh, OK. Yes. I'll put this away. Um, so we, so our Neo4j did not build a OGM, but we, there is a community OGM that's been around for a while. And there are people on our team who are helping support that. So let me bring that up for you. Uh, GitHub. And it is called Neo Model. Oh, what's this? Yes, I am not a droid. Bus, bus, bus. Is there a bus now? Is there a bus? Oh, they've caught me. They found out I am not human. <laughs> So this is one OGM. There is a, also another, there's an older one, Pi2neo, mm -hmm. uh, but that one I don't believe is supported anymore. Uh, but it still works. I still use it sometimes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, here, Neo model. Um, and this one has just been recently updated to use Neo4j5, which is our most recent edition. There's also a Django uh, variant, Neo model Django. I always forget what this one's hiding. Django Fett. Django, Django Fett. Django <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so there's a Django version as well uh, if, if you are building a Django app. Cool. Uh, there was someone else who had a hand for a question. Yes. Uh, let me, I don't know why I put this back in here. Thank you for the uh, talk. Just, I had two quick questions. Um, so the Cypher query, I'm not very familiar. Is that querying language that was developed by your team or is that like a standard or, or is that like a library or? That's a great question. Yeah. So yes, it was originally developed at Neo4j. Oh, do you have a follow-up question? OK, all right. So it was originally created at Neo4j, but in 2005, it was open sourced. So there is an open Cypher organization. And a couple other graph database companies use the same um, syntax. Right? So memgraph is a good example. Uh, I think you can also use, well, uh, like AWS Neptune and Cosmos will, will also have uh, Cypher interfaces. Um, an interesting bit. So uh, we're all, I think, very familiar with GraphQL, right, which is the REST uh, alternative. There's also a group of database companies that have gotten together. Uh, they got together like two years ago, and they are creating an ISO standard for the graph query language. Not to be confused with GraphQL, but the shorthand GQL is the same as GQL. All right, so this group is two years in, and I think they have another two years to go. But once they're done, they will have a standardized graph query syntax language, uh, just like SQL. And right now, it looks a lot like Cypher. Right? Um, so if you learn Cypher now, you have a pretty easy on-ramp to GQL when it comes out in about two years. They're getting so close. They are getting close, yeah. They're pretty far along. I think oh, yeah. it's mostly like hammering out a bunch of small details. But. Follow-up question? Yeah, and just about the um, the, the uh, map of the galaxy that, that was built, or the, the graph. Yeah. Um, when, when the nodes were placed onto the map, were they placed based on their coordinates, or were they placed based on their relationships? Coordinates, okay. right. Because if it was by just relationship, it would look different, right? It would be more like this, right, which is the system is optimizing by its relative position based on relationships, right? So this map here isn't a one-to-one -one relation to this map. And we can see that, right? Because in the Star Wars galaxy, pretty much everything toward the Western sphere is unknown, unconnected, right? But in our graph visualization, it's just a, f it's a sphere, right? So, cool. All right, did anyone else have a question? Yeah, could you just briefly touch on our deployment options for Neo4j? Okay, for... Like, is there a self-hosted oh, version, yes. cloud-hosted, you know, whatever? Right, okay. So, yes, so we do have a... 
hosted uh, uh, instance called AuraDB. I guess I'll bring this up. Oops, what am I doing? So, so this, con oops. this console here um, is AuraDB. So here you can spin up different instances of Neo4j. And once you open one of these, you'll go to this workspace, which is where you can import data here on the right. You can query the data like I've been showing here in the middle. And then we have a no-code graph explorer called uh, Bloom, which for some reason never works for my instance. It seems to work for everyone else. I need to, <laughs> I need to figure out why Bloom doesn't want to work for me. But this tool basically allows you to go through data discovery without needing to run any Cypher query calls. It will, it will give you the query if you are interested, but you don't need it. Uh, so yeah, so we have a cloud-hosted instance. You can also run locally, which is how I developed on. And you can, we have a bunch of Docker images. You can also put it into a Docker. So you can self-host. You know, all, all the usual options are available. We also have a, an expansion that goes into graph data science, which is I'm the data scientist. So um, if, you're, if you've got a server that you're running locally or um, you know, if you wanted to do cloud, we have cloud-based, it's not free, but you can run GDS within your own system. So you'll have access to that community version of that as well. So if you're looking to really spend more time on things like you know, not just the shortest path, but if you want to figure out which planet is going to muck up things for the Imperial <laughs> stormtroopers more than any other, we have different kinds of algorithms that you can run on that as well. So um, if you have any questions about any of that, you can, you can look into those as well. Hmm. Actually, you brought up a good point, right? So for ranking developers or plots, I use a really kind of a straightforward Rubik, right? I gave points for hitting certain marks. But a better system would have been to use graph data science and actually find clusters of data, right? Mm -hmm. So if a particular character interacts with a lot of different characters in particular ways, they know people, they come from a place, they've done certain actions. If we have that information in a knowledge graph, in a graph, then we can use the graph data science to give us... You can suss out the spies. Yes, we can suss them out very quickly. <laughs> like, I don't have to create a Rubik. I just basically run a algorithm that is way above my, uh, my mental capacity, <laughs> and it will tell me like, oh, according to this algorithm, these three are your top people. Right, and so that, that's what I wanted, to, I mean, obviously, like data science nerd, that's what's exciting for me too, is once you have these relationships, what can you then leverage them for? So, oh. other questions? Oh, there was one person. Oh, one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Oh, to yeah. I mean, that's where that's where most of the glory comes from. Is when we think about it, um, when you actually run the query, it's going to start with just those nodes, right? So um, you know, we have ways that we that we teach people how to optimize those queries. But if you think about it, you don't have to go through everything. It's just going to say nodes with this label, and you're already there. Nodes with this label and this relationship, you're already there. So you get through things significantly faster, especially especially when you're trying to dig into something. So, you know, when we were looking at the table that had the list of languages, right? You'd have to go into each row, then iterate through each one to see if it was there. If I just want to see all the developers that know Python, I have a Python node. I'm there already. And so that's where a lot of why you would want to use Neo4j and you'd want to use Graph is because you get right to the data much faster. I mean, a lot of art comes in with the actual data model. So what's a node? What's a relationship? Right? Um, and we, there's a lot of support in the community. I mean, we're, like, our whole DevRel team is in community every day. So any of the questions that you have, like, we can, we can walk you through. We do a lot of, we do a lot of uh, data model feedback in community because it's a different way of thinking about it that you haven't before. But efficiency-wise, that's one of the things that's beautiful about it is you go right to what you need right away. And, and if you're new to Cypher and you're kind of curious, like, you know, like what is actually happening under the hood, right? So there are two um, keywords that you can run. You can do explain, right, which the database will tell you basically it's hops, what's it doing. And if you wanted to profile, so if you wanted to compare different Cypher queries to figure out which one is the best one for your use case, there's a profile one, 
right? And so this will tell you how many rows, how many hits it's doing, right? So the goal is, is like golf. You want to go for the, the lowest number of hits to make the most efficient cipher call. Uh, yeah, you're very welcome. I think that's going to be my tool of the month on the podcast. I like that one. Oh, the profile? Yeah. Oh, yes. I need to use this more because I love making inefficient cipher. <laughs> like how, can, how do I break my database? <laughs> So, okay, yes. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. So you showed the, um, a function that was uh, shortest path. Uh, is there any way to extend that? Because I'm guessing that one's built into the query language. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to extend that with any sort of modules or something like that? Say I want to have a function to uh, get a path that goes through all the nodes or something like that. Yeah, so um, within Neo4j's uh, graph data science, we have a number of different pathfinding. I think in in our like most public, most supported, I think we've got like six or eight different pathfinding routes. You can also leverage different weights. So one of the iterations we want to put on this is the amount of time it takes to go from one planet to another. So similar to like ways, do you want the fastest path or do you want the one with the least number of stormtroopers on it? Um, but there are a number of different ways that you can and find path. So again, there, whether it's by weight, whether it includes a particular location, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of possibilities. I think we've got, I think all in, we've got like 60 different algorithms in GDS for, of different kinds. So they come into a few different types. We've got pathfinding algorithms. We have centrality algorithms. So like I said, which planet do you want to take out that's going to mess up the system the most? Um, we have similarity algorithms. So if I know that Codasaurus did a great job on the last one, I can say, okay, show me another developer who's the most similar to him or to her or whomever it may be or them. So, you know, we can use similarity algorithms. You can use it for traditional supervised machine learning. We can use them for community detection. You can use them for fraud detection. So there's a wide variety of problems that, and things that you can take on within the GDS library. And if I recall correctly, I think you can go down to the Java level and even run APOC to insert um, kind of your own logic. Mm -hmm. So if I, I, I haven't built it myself, but I do recall reading that somewhere. Yeah. So. Welcome. Other questions? All right. All right. If not. Thank you all so much. If we, if you were on the list of developers, are most likely to be hired, or uh, what was what was the the, least, the imperial yeah, the most the most imperial life. the most imperial. Um, you can come and see us at the booth. You can come up now and say hi. Either way, hopefully you put in your email address and we can drop you a note as well. Um, if you need anything, we're both e really easy to find at Neo4j. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you.